Good evening and welcome to TI Office Hours for AP Calculus. My name is Curtis Brown and I'll be hosting uh, us this evening. I'm here with Steve Kokoska and uh, with Tom Dick. He's uh, here with us this evening as well. Tom, thanks for jumping back in. Um, before we get started, I, I do just again want to, um, I guess, express gratitude um, is the main thing. Um, to all of you teachers who are out there um, who are working so hard in this incredibly difficult and challenging time. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sorry we're in this situation and, and said that we're going to do this this way, but I'm glad that we have the opportunity to get these guys in front of you yet again, um, sharing some, some more great content. But uh, I just want to thank you for your hard work and students the same. Um, I know it's tough trying to learn in this time. And so, uh, if we've got any students out there, be sure to let us know in the comments section that you're joining us. I'm um, su super excited to have you guys here with us this evening as well. A um, couple of things, housekeeping, before we get started. Um, if you have questions, uh, please post them in the comments section. That, that way, um, Steve and Tom and I can uh, jump in on those and, and talk to them. They don't have to necessarily be related to the topic that Steve or Tom is presenting, so you know, be free be free to, to answer or ask rather any question um, that you kind of see fit and we'll get to those as we can. Um, secondly, um, I just have a, I have a shout out to do and I know Steve has a couple of those as well. So I'm, I'm gonna shout out to, to Tammy Brown. I know that uh, you're watching. Thank you for uh, joining out there in uh, ULIS. I'm, I'm super excited uh, to have you this evening. And so uh, Steve, I'll let you go ahead and get started. Um, and then uh, we can we can just take it from there. All right, thank you very much, Curtis. I'm going to shut that video off, and I'm going to share my screen here if I can. And let me know if that works. Do you see that problem? That works. It looks like a very interesting problem. Right. <laughs> Good. I have lots of questions for you, Curtis. Well, look. Before <laughs> I get going, uh, I. I I want to say thank you very much to uh, Texas Instruments and to you, especially Curtis. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure for me to be able to contribute um, to our students as they prepare for this exam during these really extraordinary circumstances. And I think we, we mm -hmm. owe a, a thanks to uh, Mark Corrali and Brian Passwater too for all that they've been doing along with Birch Cornelius and uh, Tony Record and all that they've been doing for the AP Calculus community and for publicizing this. And I want to welcome a couple of people on this, too. Uh, a welcome to Paige Bruner, all that she's done for both AP Calculus and AP Stats, um, all of the AP Calculus teachers at the Hill School. And you know what, Curtis, we've got to remember our colleagues in Canada. And I want to recognize especially Crystal Dijon, who's doing a great job with technology up there in Edmonton. All right. All right. And with that said, with that said, uh, Tom and I and Curtis have thought a little bit about this and what might be a reasonable question on the exam coming up here. And uh, as you all know, uh, the analysis of functions has been a staple of the AP free response portion of the exam for many years. And so I think this is a very reasonable type of question, one that we might see on the exam, something like this that we might see on the exam. Indeed, it's got some graphs in it. It's graphical, there's an analytical part, and it brings into play a lot of concepts in the course. The fundamental theorem of calculus, I think, is in here. There's a couple of other theorems in here that I'll ask you about in a little bit. And uh, there's even some analytics in here. There's some analytical parts of this where we have to use the chain rule and the product rule. So I think this is a very reasonable type of question that we might see. So here Steve, we go. We have this continuous function. Yes. Before you jump in too far, um, I do have a question just uh, be a copy uh, of these problems available anywhere. Um, yeah, we we uh, sent this out to uh, Mark Corrali and Brian Passwater. I think both of them made them available. I think it's on the uh, AP Calculus Community uh, Facebook page. But if it isn't, I can we can certainly make it available through TI. Absolutely. Yeah, and we do plan to po um, post a link. Uh, to this set of problems in the in the chat here in the next uh, little bit. So we, we have that ready to go. Um, we should be able to do that. 
Okay, cool. We do other so we have this another question. Function, G. Oh, we may not right. even ever get started here, Steve. <laughs> um, I, I do have a question about uh, whether average value is part of the exam this year. Um, That's one of my first yeah. comments here. So I don't think mm -hmm. average value is part of the exam. However, uh, it is part A in this question because I just think it's a really cool question and it goes nicely with part B. And I think you could actually see the average value as part of a, a simple analytical expression or, or question where we ask the students to evaluate this expression and it might be the average value. So it might not be called that, but the students may be asked to evaluate it. Okay? Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Thank you. All right, we ready? Yep, I think we're ready to roll. Okay, so here we go. We have this continuous function G. And it's defined on this interval from minus four to plus 10. And the graph of G is given, in, given here and it consists of some line segments, three of them, and a semicircle. We've seen lots of questions like this uh, on the AP exam in the past. Uh, generally, these graphs that are given in the context of an analysis of function problem consists of line segments and parts of circles. Uh, generally, the reason for that is that we can find areas associated with geometric figures associated with these lines and, and circles and half circles and quarter circles. So this is a good candidate here. You remember last year's exam had sort of a, a different area problem where we had to find an area associated with a, with a circle, but we had to do some subtraction and that threw a lot of students off, I think. So in part A, I wanna see if I can find the average value of this function G over the interval minus two to four. And again, I don't think average value uh, is required on the exam this year, but again, I just think this is a nice question. And, and we may see the analytic part of this question. Then let's find the average rate of change of G over the interval minus two to four, uh, a good comparison between A and B to make sure our students know the difference between those two in general. And this is very typical of an AP exam, isn't it? Well, we have a function G hanging around and now here's a new one, capital J. It's an antiderivative of G and we know a little bit about J. And let's see if we can find J of eight. And in part D, we define yet another function, capital F, which is what I call an area so far function. And I wanna find the minimum value of F on this interval, minus four to 10. In E, there's that exact same function, capital F, and let's see if we can find the points of inflection on the graph of F. And finally, in F, part F, here's another, yet another new function, H, um, notice here, I'm going to try to write, we'll see if this works, Curtis. Notice that H has up here in that upper bound a function of X and X squared. And let's see if we can find H prime of three and H double prime of three. So a lot to do here. I don't know if we could get that done in 25 minutes on the exam, but here we go. So I'm going to present the solution here. I'm going to comment on the solution. I'm going to draw a little bit on the graph. I'm going to ask some questions along the way. So if I want to find the average value of G over the interval minus two to four, you and I know that this is one divided by B minus A. So one divided by four minus a minus two times the definite integral from minus two to four of G of X. Now, again, average value is not on the exam, but you know, part of a question like this could be to the students, uh, evaluate this expression using that graph, evaluate that expression. Well, all right, in order for me to do this, what I did is I looked at this graph and I recognized that I had to use some properties of definite integrals. And I split this up from minus two to zero, split this, the definite integral up from minus two to zero to zero to four. So off to the right-hand side here, what I've tried to do is to put some steps or some reasons, uh, pardon me, for each one of these steps. So let me see if I can arrow down just a little bit more and get this on the screen. I'm gonna draw my one vertical line in right there at minus two, one at four, and I'm gonna split this up at zero. And of course, the reason is because I can find the area of a triangle over there from minus two to zero. 
and I think I can find the area of that quarter circle from zero to four. So, okay, there's my one sixth out in front. Let's see, there's the area of the triangle, one half the base times the height, which is five, I think. And we have to subtract off now because this area, remember, this area is below the x-axis. I try to avoid talking about negative area, but in evaluating this definite integral, that region is below the x-axis, so I have to subtract off that area. And I think I've got that right. One quarter to circle pi r squared r, I think is equal to four, so four squared is 16. And I did a little bit of simplification, and there's my exact symbolic answer. I like it. Now, while I'm here, let me ask a question or two, if I can, if I can get this out to the to the participants, Curtis. Um, okay, I, that's the way that I see this question problem, to ask you. So okay, go ahead. Well, the way that I see this one, it's kind of related to uh, the mean value theorem for integrals. So I'm going to scribble a little bit, I guess, off to the side here. So the mean value theorem for integrals. And uh, it's sometimes, you know, that's not necessarily tested explicitly on the exam, uh, but it is sort of related to the, to the mean value theorem, and we'll see that in a minute. But the mean value theorem for integrals would say something like this. I, I'm not sure if it works here or not, because I've got to ask this question. It would say something like this. There exists this value of C in the interval from minus 2 to 4, so that the integral from minus 2 to 4 of G of X dx is equal to F of C times B minus A, and I'll write it as 4 minus a minus 2. Sorry, I'm sort of at the edge of the screen there. So my question is, I guess two of them. First of all, uh, is there such a value of C in this particular problem and how do we know? And if there is one, it looks kind of strange in this problem because when we talk about the mean value theorem for integrals, you know, we, we usually introduce this with the function completely above the x-axis so that the value of the function is always greater than or equal to zero. So this is kind of a weird, Example. So my question is, does the mean value theorem for integrals hold here over the integral over the interval from minus two to four for this particular function? And if so, why? And if it does, cheapers, I wonder where that value of C would be. Can you explain to me geometrically what this represents over here on the right hand side? I mean, I kind of know what this represents because I just did that up here. But what's that expression on the right-hand side represent? So I think that's a good question. I mean, I, I mean, I know we're stressing notational fluency. I know we're talking a lot about communication. I don't know if we'd see a question like that on the exam, but that's a really good conceptual uh, question, I think. So is there a value of C here? What do you think, Curtis? Um, I don't have a particular answer to that question yet. Um, I'm going to have to think on that for a minute. <laughs> okay. I'm to, to see it catch up, but we do have a little bit of a delay between the chat and what we're actually saying. So I'm going to fill that time with a question okay. for you, and that is um, a big concern that came in from Victoria St. John. She, said, she asked, um, if you can see uh, on the AP information, option three states that a P, a, G, a JPEG, and a, and a JPEG will all be accepted. Um, the question is, is can kids upload a PDF since uh, in option two, they can send in a PDF. So um, can our calculus kids send a PDF back to the college board? And I, do you guys know the answer to that question? You know, that's a real good question. It's above my pay grade, Curtis, but I, okay. I would guess, I would guess that you could upload a PDF file uh, but I, I get that one answered at a time. My understanding is that some iPhones can actually scan in and create a PDF file automatically, I think. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so that seems appropriate, uh, but I get an answer from the college board for that. For, for that okay. One. I, yeah, I would direct them back to the college board as well. I just didn't know if you had that off, uh, off the cuff. 
the other thing kind of related to that is the is the notion of using one single device, right? So whatever device they download the questions with is the device they need to upload the questions, their answers with. So um, that is a, a an important thing to, to be aware of. Um, we still don't yeah. have any answers to your questions, Steve. Um, I'm All right. not prepared right now to even think about answering that. <laughs> All right. So well, I'm I'll give you, you go I'll ahead give and little, give away the answer. I'll give you a little. I'll give you one answer. Okay. So in the mean value theorem for integrals, all we need to know is that the function g is continuous over this inner function from minus two to four. And if it is indeed continuous, then there is this value of c. And so the second part of my question is, where do you think it is? And I will let you think about that. I'll let everybody think about where that value of c might be <laughs> in this interval from minus two to four. I think that's a good question. Okay. All right. I'll think about it. All right, let's take a look at B. Let's take a look at B here. Can you stay till midnight, Curtis, to get these done? <laughs> I may I may need to stay on here till midnight. You're really putting my <laughs> <laughs> you're really putting my test here. All right. So part B was find the average rate of change of G over the interval from minus two to four. And again, I kind of like the A and B going together because I can judge whether or not students understand the difference between this idea of the average value of a function and the average rate of change. And this, is, of course, is a concept that the students learn very early on in the course. And so this should just be G of four minus G of minus two over four minus a minus two. And I did a little bit of simplification and I got a minus three halves here. Now, of course, I have a question about this one too. Uh, you and I all know uh, what this really represents. It is the slope of the secant line and I've drawn a line segment in there, part of that secant line. And that has slope, I hope if I did that right, minus three halves. And so, okay, I'm gonna think a little bit now, you know where I'm going with this. How about just the mean value theorem? And what about the mean value theorem for this function g on the interval minus two to four? So what does the mean value theorem suggest here? What does it say? What's the conclusion? Let's not think about the assumptions quite yet. But the conclusion is that there would be this value of c, at least one value of c in the interval minus two to four, so that the tangent line to the curve has the exact same slope as the secant line. So the question is, does the mean value theorem guarantee, in this case, that there is this value of C so that uh, the tangent line to the curve has the exact same slope? Now I've got my trusty ruler out here. It looks like there is one. So it looks like there is one, I'm gonna to try to draw, I know you can't see my ruler, but I'm gonna to try to draw that in. It looks like there is one like right, well, that didn't work. It looks like it's right around in here, doesn't it? Yeah, I was gonna say somewhere around a half or maybe uh, X equals one, one of those two. Well, it looks like there is one and indeed there may be one, but I contend that we're not guaranteed that there is one here. Now, there might be, but we're not guaranteed that there is one. Does anyone know why? We're not guaranteed that there is one here. That's a cool question, isn't it? We're not guaranteed that there is one here. Hmm. I wonder why. Well, let's see. G is continuous over the interval minus 2 to 4, but what's the issue here? What's the problem? It's not differentiable on that on that uh, whole thing. You have a problem. Very with good. A sharp sharp turn there at zero. Yeah, we've got an issue right here at zero. So this function is not differentiable, not differentiable over the open interval. So this is so subtle. We're I won't not... take entire credit for that. Ellen Ellen Lozano Locano. I'm not sure I said that right. Uh, put that in there. I was thinking it, but she she said it out for me. <laughs> you were thinking, okay. <laughs> well, good. This is a really nice problem. This is subtle. We're not guaranteed that there is a value of C, but indeed there may be one. We're not guaranteed that there is a value of C because 
well, darn it, this function is not differentiable over the open interval minus two to four. So there's some cool things going on in parts A and B. There's some nice connections between the two of them. Uh, we have to use the graph here in part A to answer this question. We can visualize this answer in part B, which those of you who know me know I really like that a lot. Let's take a look at part C. So in part C, we've got this brand new function, capital J, and we know that it is an antiderivative of G, and we know that G of, pardon me, J of minus three is equal to five, and we want to find J of eight. Uh, I'm going to try to scribble a little bit off to the left-hand side here. I started out by writing this expression, and sometimes uh, to some students, that's a little foreign. Where did that come from? It is actually the fundamental theorem of calculus, at least the way I see it. And it comes from actually, in my mind, uh, an expression like this, the integral from minus three to eight of g of x dx is equal to, well, the fundamental theorem says if we have n antiderivative of g, which we do, it is j. We know that that's j of eight minus j of minus three. So all I did was I took that expression and I solved up here for j of eight. So I like this problem. I, I see a problem like this on the exam coming up because it tests the fundamental theorem of calculus, the most important idea in the course. I, I can really see something like this. So we're given J of minus three. We have to find that definite integral and I'm gonna employ a similar strategy here. Let's see if I get this right. I'm gonna split this up from minus three to zero and then from zero to eight. So I've got to find the area of that region. I've got to subtract off the area of that region. So let's see the area from minus three to zero. That's a triangle. I see that in here. One half the base three times the height of that triangle, which is five. Got that. Then again, I have to subtract off because this region is below the X axis. And let's see, that's a half a circle now. So one half pi r squared, one half pi times 16. I did a little simplification and there's my symbolic answer, my analytical answer for J of eight. I think that's a classic problem. We've seen lots of these on free response questions in the past. I see one of these on the exam coming up. Any questions about that one, Curtis? Um, we haven't gotten any questions about that one. I was made aware, um, that uh, the PDF is allowed um, as an upload. So the oh, question good. about that earlier, um, the PDF is, is allowed, so um, we'll be okay there. Good, excellent. All right, let's take a look at D. I've got some other questions, lots of questions about this one. So now we have another new function, capital F, and it's defined to be what I call, again, an area so far function, the area under the curve G of T from zero to X. I wanna find the minimum value, and I apologize, I perhaps didn't uh, add another word in here, but I want the absolute minimum value of this function, capital F, over the interval minus four to 10. And uh, the first thing before I even begin to solve this one is, I'm going to ask, <laughs> is there one? Is there an absolute minimum value? I don't want to go searching here aimlessly. I want to make sure that there is one. And so how do I know that there is one? How do I know that there is an absolute minimum value of this function capital F on this interval? That's a, that's a good question. There's some nice conceptual, I think, ideas there. Uh, any ideas, any answers on that about why that might be, why we know there is an absolute minimum in that interval? I think I'm looking for two things here, two things that have to be true. Any ideas at all? Hmm. I think I'll let that play through on the YouTube channel and I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna bring up something that has been brought up, which is a question about whether people can post these videos on their YouTube channel. Um, the answer to that question is yes, um, they can. They can post them in their Google classrooms. They can post them, link them in their, um, YouTube, they can use these, um, feel free to use them. So um, we definitely want them doing that. So Google Classroom is a great way to share this content with your students. All right, well, I'm gonna underline one thing and then ask this question one more time, darn it. I'm gonna get an answer to this one. Ooh, so how I got do I know it. That this Continuous on a closed <laughs> interval. 
<laughs> okay, so I see the closed interval. I got that. Excellent. But I don't see continuity. That's not screaming out at me in Kmart blue light. So how do I know that this function capital F is continuous? Ooh, uh, the second how do I know that? Ooh. Man. Hmm, how do I know that? How do I know that this function capital F is continuous? I'll give you a little hint. Here's its derivative. And so what does that tell you? The function has a derivative. It is, therefore, uh, continuous. Difference. Right, Curtis? Curtis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it is continuous, okay? So that's a cool, cool introduction, I think, to this problem. So, all right, it has an absolute minimum. Now, I'm going to go through this in kind of a straightforward, brute force way. This is the way that I, I teach this in my class. If I am looking for an absolute minimum value of this function, I know that I have to check at the endpoints and I have to check at the critical values. So the critical values are all those places where the derivative is zero or does not exist. So the first thing I'm gonna do is see where f prime of zero, f prime of x, excuse me, is equal to zero. That is equivalent to where g of x is equal to zero. And in order to find that, darn it, I'm just gonna look down here at the graph. I think I've got an x equal minus three, I've got an x equal zero, I've got an x equal eight. Are there any places where f prime of x does not exist? Well, remember, capital F prime is g of x, and g of x is defined, excuse me, and exists over that entire interval minus 4 to 10. So there are, that sounds funny, but there are no places where f prime of x does not exist. Now, you are correct. I know somebody out there is saying, well, look, I know that I can throw out a couple of, or at least one of these values right away. I'm looking for the absolute minimum value. And if this represents a derivative here, I know that the function capital F is increasing and then decreasing across zero. I could throw zero out right away. I encourage your students, if they do something like that on the exam, don't just throw it out arbitrarily without saying anything. Make sure that you re make a remark. Look, I know I can get rid of zero because it's a local max. Otherwise, do it my way. Do it with a candidate's <laughs> test and evaluate this function, capital F, at all of these, well, candidates for an absolute minimum. I have to evaluate capital F at the two endpoints and all of these critical values. Okay, I won't go through this in gory detail with you. But the way that I evaluated capital F, let me just write in the first one here. We know that this expression right here, by the definition, is the integral from zero to minus four of g of x dx. Now, you've got to be careful about this, right? This is zero to minus four, which is kind of backwards, right? The bounds are sort of reversed for us. So how do you figure this out? Well, there are two ways, at least in my mind, to do this. I'm going in this direction, so if I want to find that area, it is positive. It contributes a positive value to this definite integral, but since I'm go working to the left, I have to subtract it off. This region right here is below the x-axis, ordinarily contributes a negative value, but since I'm working backwards, <laughs> I have to add it in. Another way to look at this, another way to think about it is to, well, just use a property of definite integrals and rewrite this as minus the integral from minus 4 to 0 of g of x dx, or g of t, I think I had up there, I apologize. And then just evaluate this definite integral in the usual way, thinking about areas above the x-axis as contributing a positive value, below the x-axis as contributing a negative value. Anyway, I went about and figured out all of these. Let's see, this one was the Ooh. definite integral from zero to 10 of g of x or g of t dt, g of x dx. Let's see, that's from here all the way over to 10. So I've got a large negative value. And then I add in the area of a triangle. This one's pretty easy, g of zero is zero. And then of course, what I need to do here is I need to look at these values and pick out the smallest value. Now, it might be a little tricky to see here, but minus eight pi 
is certainly the largest negative value here. It is the smallest value. It is the minimum value. And if you're doing something like this, if your students are doing something like this on the exam, I would remind them, don't just leave the table. Make sure that you answer the question. If the question asks for what is the minimum value, report the value. If the question asks where does the absolute minimum value occur, remember to report the X value. Uh, one sort of drawback to this approach is that if you use this tabular method, you have to make sure that every value that you write in the table is correct. So if there are all these values to test and you happen to make a mistake, even like writing that as a plus 15 over 2, then you, a student would not get the justification point. So you have to be careful in these problems. The so table is taken as justification, but it must be correct. I apologize. Go ahead, Curtis. No, that's okay. Um, so, Steve, we did get one question about should we evaluate the critical number, um, a critical number, even if it is a relative maximum. I see you had that, uh, mm -hmm. that you didn't. So, so, so I did. I evaluated out of habit and out of a prescriptive way to solve these problems. However, okay. a student would not have to, in general, as long as they would give a reason for eliminating it. Sure. If they would just add one sentence that says, look, I know I don't have to evaluate at zero because there's a local maximum there. Done. Sure. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And one more um, okay. question, and this was, uh, this was more related to just the, the, uh, the exam itself, um, and that is uh, on, the, on the Calculus Facebook group, um, there's a question. If students write, um, handwrite the question, um, we, we know um, that PDF is acceptable. Do they use the handwritten option or use save text uh, to upload? Um, my answer to that is I think we, I don't know. Um, do, you, do you either of you know? Yeah, Tom, I, I don't I don't know what the answer to that is. I think if you're, um, if you're doing the exam on your computer, you would have to get a PDF file, I think, to your computer, which you could through your phone, I guess. Yeah, I know they, I, I'm pretty sure they're anticipating some students will um, use the camera on their phone to take a picture of their handwritten work and send that in. Um, but I, I want to be cautious here exactly what the I know they're going to try to, to um, work as hard as they can to be flexible about how students can get, get their work submitted. Um, but yeah, I don't have a definitive answer for that. Okay. Okay. Um, and I think there was one other question. Oh, go ahead and keep going. I'll, I'll get back to that other question in a minute. Okay. All right, I got a couple more here, Curtis, and then I'll hand it over to Tom. Uh, I like this one a lot also. Here's another. Here's our same function, capital S. Again, defined as an area so far function. And this time I want to find the X coordinates of all the points of inflection on the graph. Now, don't panic. There's a sign chart here, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to solve this again in a very straightforward brute force way. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at this again in kind of a quicker way a more conceptual way. Uh, but here's the way that I might solve this, all right, in a very prescriptive way. So I know that if I want to find the points of inflection, I want to find what I would call candidates again. I want to find places where the second derivative of capital F is zero or the second derivative of F does not exist. So I've got the first derivative of capital F. I can take another derivative. And so I know the second derivative of capital F is getting confusing now is G prime of X. Okay, so let's see. I wanna find the candidates for point of inflection. Now, again, this is a very prescriptive way to do it and we'll get a sneaky way in a minute here. I wanna find where a capital F double prime is zero. That's where G prime of X is equal to zero. So the way that I did that is I went to the graph, and that means I have to find places on the graph of G where the tangent line has slope zero. Well, there's only one place where that occurs, and it's down here 
where X is equal to four. So I've got one candidate already. I have to find places where F double prime of X doesn't exist. Well, that would be where G prime does not exist. This is a little tricky, but this is where the derivative of G does not exist. So I can determine those by looking at the graph and finding these, seeing these sharp edges or corners. So I know that there is no derivative for G right there. That's at X equal minus two. We already talked about this one. It's subtle, but it's there. There's no derivative at zero. And there's no derivative for G right there at eight. Okay, so this is how I would construct a, a sign chart. And I'm gonna add a little bit to this too, if I can. Um, this function, capital F, is only defined from minus 4 to 10, so I'd probably add some brackets here. And if I were doing this in class, I'd even probably put a couple of big X marks out here because those values are not in the domain. I know the domain for this function is minus 4 to 10. After I draw my horizontal line, I put some important points in here. I put the endpoints, of course, and I put these values of X where the second derivative is zero or does not exist. And I indicate that up above here. Now, I need to figure out the sign of F double prime in these intervals marked off or determined by these candidates. How did I figure that out? I don't have a function up there for F double prime. So this will lead me into the, the sneaky way to find this or the nice conceptual way to find these answers. I have to determine whether F double prime is positive or negative, let's say in this first interval from minus four to minus two. How do you do that? Well, I take a look at this function G and it, I take a look at G prime and this function G is increasing over that and what's G prime doing? Well, G prime is increasing on that interval. There's a plus sign there. So I did that for all of these intervals determined by these candidates. I found all of those signs by looking at the graph. And then what I did is I looked for changes in concavity and I found two of them. And so the X coordinates of the points of inflection are minus two to four. So, okay. If, if I were to do this in a sneaky way, I would look at this graph of G I wanna, and I would ask, where does G prime change from positive to negative? And G prime changes from positive to negative right there. It changes from positive to negative at X equal, what was the other one from here? Four right here. Positive. Changes from negative to positive. Where does G prime change from negative to positive or from positive to negative? Where does G prime change from negative to positive or positive to negative? And it changes at those two values. And those are my X coordinates of my point of inflection. Now I'm gonna to try to justify this and this will lead into something that Tom will do in a minute, I think, I hope. Uh, sometimes in a problem like this where we have an area so far function, we often ask our students, to find a couple of values of this area so far function like capital F, and then to draw a rough sketch. And I actually did this with some technology. And if everything's working out correctly, you can actually just about see that point of inflection right there. And the other point of inflection right here where X is equal to four. So this is the original graph of my function G. It's not drawn with an aspect ratio of one, so you don't see the nice circle right here. I had to do that so that I could get the graph of F on here. And if everything's working out correctly, you can also see there's my absolute minimum value. Tie that back together with the previous part of this. So lots of little things going on in there. We can find those answers in a very prescriptive way. We can also find those answers graphically by looking at uh, this function G, the graph of the function G. Let me solve one more and I'll hand it over to Tom. 
Finally, here's another function, capital H, defined to be the integral from zero to x squared of g of t dt, and I want to find h prime and h double prime. I think this is a nice problem, too, because it tests, I think, not only the product rule in here, but also the chain rule. Gee, Chris, if there's a fundamental theorem of calculus problem on the exam, there's got to be a problem or a part that involves the chain rule. How do I find h prime of x? Well, it is g of x squared. I've got to take that argument and plug it in here times the derivative of the inner function. I'm not going to write this out in gory detail, but I know you have done this with your students where you actually uh, substitute or make a change of variables here and rewrite this function h in terms of u and actually use the chain rule to see this more explicitly. Our students are really good at this, and they know that they have to take g of that argument times the derivative of the inner function, which is 2x. And now I need to find h prime of 3. So that's, let's see, g of 9 times 6. How do you get g of 9? Well, all right, let's see. I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to arrow back here quickly. Hey. I've got to go back over here to my original function g. And let's see, where's g of 9? Is that a 2 it looks like? Is that what I put in there? Hey, how about that? Two times six is 12. So I got the same answer again. Okay. Hey, Steve, one, uh, yes. just you go ahead and keep going, but just know I've got a question for you about part E here in just a second. Okay, deal. H double prime of X. Well, let's see. I'm going to take the derivative of this expression. I have to recognize that this is a product. Now you're absolutely right. Um, I could indeed pull that constant 2 out in front of everything, but I just left it together as one function 2x. So the derivative of the first function, be careful here, is g prime of x squared times the derivative of the inner function times this function, the second function, plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Okay, product rule, chain rule there, cool problem, plug in an x equal 3. And the only extra twist in this one is, well, I had to find g of 9 again, but now I've also got to find g prime of 9. How do you do that? Whoa, let's go back to this function again. Well, g prime of 9, I'm going to write that in up here, is actually the slope of this curve, the slope of the function g at 9. Well, we're lucky. G is a straight line segment right there. And so in order to find the derivative of g at 9, I just need the slope of that line. And son of a gun, that's also 2. So I'm going to plug that in, do a little bit of arithmetic, and I got a 76 there. Curtis, I'll get to your question in one minute. I'm going to write one more thing down here. Um, let's get another function in here. We need one more, darn it. This is a free response question. Let's get a k of x. This will be an open question, one for your students to work on. What if we had a definite integral to find something like this? Oh, I don't know. Let's put in an e to the x and an x squared up here so that both of the bounds are actually functions of x. And let's put a g of t dt in there. Um, I don't even know if you can find this answer or not, but we might want to know something like what's k prime of 3. Could you do something like that? And again, I don't know if that works out. I don't know if uh, the values will be in my domain of G, but what I'm really interested in is can you find K prime of X? Okay, go ahead, Curtis. Sorry, thank you for that. Okay, no worries. Um, two things. One, I need to ask you a question about uh, part E, which is do we have to include the values where uh, G prime keeps the same sign in our justification or can we just go straight to the values of G prime where it does change sign. So this is part E, correct? Yes. Okay. So if a student were reporting this answer, my guess is that they wouldn't do much of this at all. This is just a guess. A student is going to look at this graph. Your students are so good. They're going to look at this graph and they're going to know immediately that the points of inflection are at minus two and four, but they've got to report some sort of justification. So remember, a sign chart is a nice tool, but you still have to report a justification. You have to communicate that in a sentence. So my guess is that most students are going to look at this graph and say, oh, 
Well, uh, there's a X coordinate of the points of inflection are minus two and four because F prime, G prime, excuse me, changes sign at those values. And that would be sufficient. You would not have to address what's going on at zero uh, or eight. Okay, that's a good, thank you for the clarification on that. And then secondly, I did get a question uh, earlier, much earlier, and I, I failed to bring it up until just now, is are you going to do any portion of these questions that will relate to BC tonight? Um, is there a section that we'll have for BC calculus, um, maybe an extension uh, uh, for tonight? I, I have no other parts to this. I don't know if Tom does, but I would certainly be willing, uh, Curtis, if you'd like us to put together another question that is, you know, has some BC parts in it, we can certainly do that. Okay, be thinking about that for a minute um, and we'll turn it over to Tom here um, and let him kind of uh, take over for the next uh, little bit and get to his questions that he's um, put together. All right, Tom, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's see. I'll try to share my screen and uh, see if this works. Can be Beautiful. Able. Okay. Um, so, as as Steve mentioned, the, the question at play here. Um, it, it's a really nice example question. There's been a question like this on the AP exam, I think each year for the last 20 years in some way or other. It's one that, <laughs> where it's graphically presented and it's such a rich question because it, um, you can ask questions about the fundamental theorem, you can ask questions about extrema. It's, it it uh, has students having to think conceptually and graphically. Uh, it One was to, um, actually enter this function analytically. That's what I've done here on the, the TI-84. I just wanted to illustrate that, you know, we can create that. Uh, I think Steve had a picture of a graph he had created with using some technology, but this is just using the TI-84. It might take a quick peek behind the scenes here. Uh, we've got uh, Y1. Let me go over, actually pretend that I'm editing it, but what I did was I uh, certainly not something that a student would do with this question on on the exam is try to enter this analytically, but just doing that to illustrate if we're using this for a teaching question, we might want to uh, do some investigations with it graphically. So I had to figure out the equation for each piece over each interval. And you can see that it's entered uh, like you would enter twice functions. So I had to figure out how to get that uh, half circle and all those things. And that's how I came up with this graph. Uh, Steve mentioned getting an antiderivative graph, or one of the antiderivative graphs. I think that was the function um, F, capital F, that he had. Uh, and I happen to have that in Y2. Uh, Y1, I just referred to, that's the integral from zero to X of Y1. Uh, but just a warning here, if I try to graph that here, um, it's having to, it's forcing the uh, calculator to calculate a definite integral for each value of X. So that can really slow things down. Uh, but we can try to get a, a look at the graph here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my X rev to say uh, three. And um, go ahead and hit graph. You can see it's a little chunkier. That's because it's only plotting every third pixel. Uh, but after a while, we should see the graph of the antiderivative start to crawl across the screen. So there's this anticipation, I know, from everyone, will the graph actually appear? Uh, let's take a look. That that may not have been checked off, Tom. I'm not sure. Oh can you go God. back to one? Can you do that? Oh, you're right. Yeah. It, that's why that will really slow it down. <laughs> it may not graph at all. Hey, Tom, another, um, just another tip um, while that is plotting there. You can also turn off on the format um, piece of your uh, window there. You can ask it to not check for asymptotes. So um, you can. Oh, okay. 
like that as well. And that will speed things up as well. Um, I did just well, get a question well, about is the is this app available on the iPad? Um, the 84 plus CE app is not available on the iPad, but there is a TI Inspire app for iPad uh, available. And so it's a fully functional graphing calculator. So you can definitely use uh, that on the iPad. Um, in just a minute, maybe at the end of this session, I'll um, go to the TI website and show you where you can download that for free um, right now. So. Right. Okay. Tom, uh, can you also, Tom, is it also possible if you wanted to, could you uh, go to the table feature? And if you had some candidates for maxes or mins, could you use the ask feature to evaluate this function capital F in the table feature? Uh, sure. Yeah, I should be able to. Okay. Let me, see, let me go to the table. Looks like you're still evaluating. Oh, that could be. So I, let me just uh, well quit that, but let me go to the table. Let's see. I think it's going to take a minute, Steve, uh, Tom, because it's okay. got to evaluate those those points uh, for the table. So you might let that go in the background. Oh, um, uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so, Steve, you were asking about uh, uh, here it's got you know, all these integer values. So we've got all of your candidates plus some, though we don't have the negative values, I think. So, right, uh, right. Ask for, uh, let's see. What well, you could values? scroll up, though. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, there we go. So it's generated. Hey, there you go. Minus three. Yeah. Hey, that's beautiful. And minus five yeah. was out of our domain. And so that's why yep. we're getting that. Okay. Uh, that's so, cool. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. Thanks, Tom. All right. Um, so, Steve, I don't know how we're doing on time, but um, Steve had generated several questions. The thing about a STEM like that. Uh, is there's lots of uh, other questions one could ask. Uh, one of these Steve actually looked at, I think he asked about, uh, could you actually use the mean value theorem on that one interval? Um, we might look, here, here's one I uh, looked at this, D prime. It says find the equation line tangent to the graph of y equals capital F of x at x equals negative two, or explain why the tangent line does not exist. Uh, if we think about uh, Steve's original graph, uh, actually, let me get my TI-84 and look at that graph again. At x equal negative 2, there was this sharp corner, but that's the sharp corner in the graph of G, which is the derivative of capital F. Uh, so mm -hmm. that one looking at that sharp corner might think, oh, wow, there couldn't be a tangent line there. They'd be looking really at the wrong function. So since this is the derivative of our function, we're actually asking, is there a tangent line to this red graph at x equal negative 2? And this graph looks nice and smooth, and it looks like there would be a tangent line. So I'll just uh, take you through you know, what that would look like. Um, over here, find my solution to D prime here. So we're looking for a tangent to the graph of the y equal capital F by the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, capital F prime is just our a G function, which we had a graph of. And this uh, value of D at negative two was positive five. So that would be the slope of our tangent line. And we can evaluate f of negative two. Uh, that's going to be the negative of the area of a triangle formed by the graph of g and the x-axis. I'll go back and take a quick look. That's the area of this triangle. Uh, but we're integrating from zero to negative two, so we're going to have to take the opposite of that. So that'll be end up being a uh, negative five. Okay. 
Uh, and so now we have the, our point is negative two comma negative five. Our slope is positive five. And so we could either use point slope form or simplify it to y colon x plus b form. So that, that's another kind of question one could ask on this, uh, this kind of STEM. It's really rich STEM in terms of the kinds of things you could ask. You could ask about intervals where your function capital F is increasing or concave up or concave down, all kinds of things. So, okay. uh, that's about all I've got. Okay. Well, thank you, Tom. Um, really quickly, um, I did, I was made aware, a, a couple of questions came in asking where we got the, the information about whether calculus kids could upload the PDF. And there was a, um, Trevor Packer did a uh, webinar last night um, relating to math. And so that's where that information is coming from. Um, that, uh, that piece um, confirming the PDFs was uh, from that as well. Uh, Steve, I've got you muted there, so you'll need to unmute yourself to be able to talk. Um, just, <laughs> just a heads up. Um, so there is a question about whether students can use online graphing uh, utilities. Students can use really anything during the uh, AP exam uh, in the coming, you know, during that time. The, uh, the intent, I believe, was that to make it fairly calculator agnostic. I think that's the term that I've heard uh, repeated uh, over and over. Um, and that is you know, that they're not necessarily going to be dependent on any uh, graphing utility or, or uh, you know, some kind of calculator that way. So certainly they could use an online graphing utility uh, if they wanted to for some reason, or if they, they thought they might need to, that would uh, be acceptable. Um, Couple of other things. Um, I we did just post in the um, in the chat for any final questions, so I'd like to make sure that we wait long enough to be able to answer those things. Um, I do have a question back to you, Steve and or Tom. Have you had a chance yet to think uh, about a BC question? And if so, great. If not, um, I do think we probably would uh, love to be able to to post maybe a, a BC question uh, or something similar. Uh, in the coming uh, days to this YouTube uh, channel. Uh, to the uh, channel. I've got one possibly, Curtis, would okay. be. Uh, so on the BC exam um, for this upcoming administration, um, some topics that won't be covered will be things like parametrics uh, in 2D and, and polar. Uh, but I think uh, as far as a graph is concerned, a uh, person could get a... Uh, an arc length question. That wouldn't be an AB question, but it would be a, a BC question. Uh, so on sure that piece right there, we could have asked a, an, an arc length question, although um, because we had a circle, it might be a relatively- Right, true. that's, that's kind of interesting thing is you could actually use geometry to figure out arc length here because you've got pieces of lines and uh, circles. So, okay, um, but it could be okay. posed as you'd have maybe a to recognize, oh, I just need to find the length of this curve to figure this out, so. Okay, okay. So that could be a really nice BC application based sure. yeah. Uh, yeah. Steve's question that he, he had written. So, That's a nice application. So Tom, help me on this. Uh, I understand that on the AB particle motion problems will not be asked, but on the BC, are particle motions problem, problems possible? Is that true? Well, I mean, uh, rectilinear, just along a straight line. Um, so if that's true, then you can certainly ask a particle motion problem and get, you know, the fundamental theorem of calculus in there. You could even, uh, we have seen those types of problems before uh, where uh, the velocity graph may be presented, the velocity function, excuse me, may be presented graphically. So you can actually have a question very similar to what we did here in the context of particle motion for BC. Right. Now I'm, I wonder, yeah. Right. Now I wonder, uh, I don't know, people will certainly ask about series. There are some topics in series that are fair game to the exam, but boy, I, I don't know whether or not we'll see a series problem. I, I'm just, I don't know about that. Okay. Well, I think there, I, I'm going to 
think that they'll they'll get at least some topics in series because there certainly are some topics in BC on series that are preserved uh, around series. So um, I guess I would be surprised if they don't have some coverage there. But uh, yeah. So okay. Um, I'm. I just got the. Um... I just got the link to the the YouTube or to the uh, webinar from the college board where Trevor Packer um, did that. I'll see if I can get that typed up and into the chat here uh, in the next uh, little, just a second. And then, um, oh, I do want to show, thank you for the reminder. I do want to show uh, one thing on my screen. Uh, and that is, I, I mentioned at the beginning that, that you could get the iPad app uh, and some of the other softwares um, for free right now um, for the next uh, few months. Um, and so I wanna make sure that I put that out there and show people where to get that um, because I did mention it. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see, screen number two, share. Uh, there we go. Uh, so you can see the, the uh, TI Texas Instruments uh, homepage, education.ti.com. Um, Currently on our homepage, there's a, a, a button here for COVID-19 support. That'll be the first thing you see when you pull up. Uh, and you can click on this uh, download now action button. There are um, three possibilities here, uh, available resources. One, uh, software for teachers and students, um, for TI Inspire and for um, TI uh, 84 plus CE, the SmartView software. So we've got that, um, we've got that available. Um, and out there. Also, uh, there is uh, the same thing for the iPad solution. Um, right now, just to highlight that, it's free for download in the App Store till May, uh, end of May 2020. So you've got uh, just a little while longer to be able to grab that. Um, but once you've got it, the cool thing about that is once you've got it, it's yours. So um, it's not going to expire on you, which is really kind of nice. Uh, and then we've got a, a Chromebook solution that you guys can get some more information about um, by filling out a little form here. So just a couple of things um, to, to put in there. And I'm gonna put in one shameless plug for both you, Steve and uh, Tom, the work that you guys have done uh, for us in AP Calculus. We've got a, a underneath of our resources tab, there is a, a section called TI in Focus AP Calculus, uh, where Steve and Tom have been um, taking the, the previous years uh, free response questions, all nine of them uh, for A, B, and, and the B, C also ones. Um, and for the last three years, these guys have gone into those questions um, and they have created resource videos. So there are a series of videos going into the scoring and common errors, um, also the technology solutions. So Steve actually has um, dove into the, each of these questions, even the non-technology ones and shown um, some explorations you could do with your students um, to kind of deepen their knowledge. And then uh, a topic summary video that shows, um, shows some really nice stuff on uh, the topic or the main topic for that particular question. Um, some really great teaching stuff there. Uh, Tom has developed uh, supporting technology videos for each one of those. So a little bit more how-to technology uh, for those. And then of course you've got downloads and things uh, ready for that. So totally um, accessible, some really nice uh, pieces that those guys have put together uh, for that. So I'm going to look back in here to the chat and see if there's anything else uh, I need to do. Um, otherwise, I will um, let us get going. Besides, oh, here's a good question. Besides particle motion, what other kinds of questions will not be tested? For AP calculus. I want to make sure we get a chance uh, for there. Anything from unit eight? Um, I might correct me if I'm wrong, but I think unit eight is is out out of bounds, right? For AB. Both of you are muted. I don't I I don't want to misspeak Curtis. I would go directly to one of the college board sites, AP Central, and and look at that exactly. I don't want to misspeak on anything. I don't have that in front of me. Okay. I don't have it in front of me either, but we do have some folks uh, posting that, that Unit 8 will not be on the test uh, this year. Volume, disk, washer, uh, cross sections, that sort of things. Um, 
not going to be there. Um, but I agree. Um, definitely go to the to the horse's mouth, so to speak. Um, right, go straight there and and ask uh, and and ask from the College Board. They've got some great information. Uh, let me get this webinar typed into the to the chat here. Um, and otherwise, um, I don't see any other any other questions in the chat that we need to take care of. So um, I will I will get this this link posted here as quick as I possibly can, and um, we'll sign off for for this evening. So thank you guys very much for your time, and and again, students and teachers, thank you so much for your hard work. Uh, I really really appreciate uh, really really appreciate all of the all that you guys are doing. Um, good luck.